So um, welcome to session one of the BitCurator uh, Forum this year. We're very excited about the forum. If you haven't seen the opening remarks, um, they are recorded and available on the forum website. Um, the hashtag is uh, capital bit curator forum with the bit the curator in the forum all capitalized. And if you have any trouble today during the sessions, you can email nancy at educopia.org. Um, each presenter will have 15 minutes and Q&A will follow both presentations. Um, so first up, we have the session Kiwi, Building a New Open Source App for Archivists, presented by Ethan Gates from Yale University Library. Uh, welcome, Ethan. Good morning, everyone. Um... Sorry, just making sure I've got all my windows and uh, settings straight, but I think I'm ready. Can you all hear me? Yes, everything's good. Thank you, Gary. Uh, good morning. So my name is Ethan Gates. I'm a software preservation analyst for Yale University Library and user support lead on the EASY grant-funded program of work, which stands for Emulation as a Service Infrastructure. Um, and I'm very excited to be here kicking off um, the talks for BitCurator Forum and to talk to you all today about Kiwi. Uh, I've worked for several years now, either on or with open source archival software, but usually um, via documentation or testing or training or feedback. Um, Kiwi is my first attempt to actually build and code and maintain an application from scratch. Uh, next slide, please. So what is Kiwi? Let's back up uh, for a minute to the last BitCurator forum uh, in Ooh, when was that? 2021, where I gave a lightning talk on archival advantages and use cases for QMU, which is an open source command line based emulator. I'm not going to repeat that whole presentation. I think it's a great watch if you want to go back and revisit. Um, but one of the main points I covered regarding obstacles or, or difficulties in getting started with QMU is that it lacks an officially supported cross platform graphical user interface or GUI. As with many command line applications, QMU is extremely powerful and flexible, but this flexibility can also be extremely intimidating without the guardrails provided by drop down menus or radio selection buttons or file selection widgets. Uh, it's very easy to feel lost in the wilderness of a blank terminal. Next slide, please. So for several years, I knew that an open source GUI for QMU aimed at library and archive professionals would likely be a valuable project. Um, and I even had specific examples from the community to point to. Tessa Walsh's Brunhilde GUI and Johan van der Neef's mini suite of imager tools, um, which includes disk imager, OM imager, and tape imager, were direct inspirations for the kind of thing I wanted to see available for QMU simple, straightforward graphic interfaces for command line utilities. Since those tools are open, I even tried at several points to inspect their code. They're all written in Python. And I tried to deduce whether I could simply copy their work and somehow adjust their parameters to work with QMU instead. But I'll be honest, my Python skills just failed me. I've very rarely had a reason to use Python in my day-to-day -day work, and building a graphical application with Python is a very different kind of goal from the many data processing and automation tasks that make up the vast majority of Python tutorials that I've seen aimed at library and archive professionals. So just from trying to read code by myself on GitHub, though I could maybe conceptually understand and name the different components that I was looking at, that's a script, that's a variable, that's a loop. I had a difficult time understanding how these particular pieces translated into the bright, shiny GUIs that came out the other end. So I would just wind up giving up and dropping the whole idea. That equation shifted a bit when my colleague at Yale, David Sorella, shared a project he had been working on, working on called Yes Creator. If you could just click Jess um, for the animation. That stands for Yale Easy SIP Creator, a tool to help internal stakeholders at Yale ingest their materials into Preservica. Yes, Creator was first a command line Python script, and David had then built a simple GUI on top of that script uh, using a Python library called, confusingly, GUI. That's GUI spelled G-O-O-E-Y this time. Next slide. Thank you. I would be hard pressed to articulate exactly why the source code for David's GUI-based GUI 
clicked for me where other methods of accomplishing the same task had not. But something about this particular tool and configuration hit that particular sweet spot for both software and professional development. Close enough to my project that I could see which parts were applicable and quickly reusable, but also different enough from my goals that recontextualizing and rewriting the code required very specific questions and challenges that I could work through one by one in a bite-sized manner. Next slide, please. And you can go ahead and start trying to play the video. Um, I know you gotta move over to the tab. Thanks, Jess. Uh, the result uh, of my efforts is Kiwi, which is a graphical QMU launcher intended to assist archivists and digital curators in particular by narrowing down the vast number of settings and choices uh, available to a QMU user to the most important, the most common, uh, the most essential choices to launch an emulator. Uh, it's compatible with Mac OS, Windows, and Linux systems like the BitCurator environment, and the only requirement is that you have previously installed QMU, um, but QMU itself is also cross-compatible, big open source project with a lot of documentation about how to install it, so I hope that's not too onerous. Um, I'm not seeing the video. I don't know if anyone else is getting that. I'm mostly just seeing a, a blank screen. Oh, thank you for letting me know that. I was watching yes. the whole thing here on my own. I'm sorry. <laughs> Let me, um, no problem. Replay this. I think Zoom was very helpfully trying to not show the video. It might be a tab versus a. Mm -hmm. Sorry about this. No problem. Here, I'm going to have to reshare. That's okay. It'll just take a second. Uh, well, when we get going, what you are about to see is a just a quick demo video uh, with no audio of using Kiwi to use QMU to select emulated hardware settings and launch a virtual machine running MS-DOS. Uh, looks like there we go. Thanks so much, Jeff. Um, and there will be a glimpse at the very end of some old Lotus software as well, Lotus 1.2.3 for MS-DOS. Apologize for the small window sizes. Hope everyone can maybe at least get a glimpse of that. Uh, obviously, the pixel resolution size on MS DOS is pretty small. Um, great. Thanks, Jess. And we can move on to the next slide. Fascinating to see what YouTube is trying to recommend off of uh, my demo video. Thanks. Sorry, I'm just going <laughs> to hear it. No problem. Just a second. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jess, uh, for, yeah. for wrangling that. I know we had some video playback issues. Um, all right, everyone, I'm uh, going to power through this. Rather than dig into everything that Kiwi can do or can't do or all the things that I would like it to do, I do want to use these few minutes that we have left here to dig further into some of the thoughts and questions and concerns that have come up for me the past few months in this experience of starting to you know, make and implicitly maintain a piece of open source software for the first time. Uh, and you can click through uh, the first section there, Jess. The first question was, literally, when do I work on this? While using QMU is related to my everyday duties of supporting emulation services and the easy platform specifically, build and maintain a QMU GUI has certainly never been identified as one of my specific job duties or a grant deliverable. 
So working on Kiwi on the clock at Yale would fall under the category of professional development. I can only speak here for my personal experience. I'm cognizant of the fact that even others, particularly non cis hetero white men at my well resourced Ivy League workplace may not share this experience, but I do consider myself personally lucky to be in a work situation that is highly supportive of professional development. That means budget for conference registration and attendance, subscriptions to a number of online tools and services that I can use to ask questions and build skills, but most critically, it means time. The time to set aside an hour or two on Friday to trawl Stack Overflow or test how a certain color setting is rendering on Mac versus Windows. But even so, even when feeling empowered to use that time, I don't have a neatly compartmentalized professional development brain that turns off at 5 p.m. I've leaked into solving problems or adding features on my time, begging the question of whether what I'm doing is now still professional development or personal pet project. I'm a dedicated puzzler, I like crosswords, sudoku, jigsaw puzzles, and working on Kiwi activates many of the same pleasure centers. But that means if I'm not careful about boundaries, it is very, very easy to lose a sense of balance doing this kind of work. I have a much better understanding now of how open source software, particularly volunteer run open source software, lives on a knife's edge between passion project and critical infrastructure, between nice to have and necessity, between paid, unpaid, and exploited labor. The other tension or conundrum that I've been mulling over is that of solo versus community driven development. Obviously, the path of least resistance to making this tool that I wanted to see out in the world and that I would enjoy tinkering with was to make it myself using resources under my control, my GitLab account, my old MacBook, my next cloud server. That's all fine if this truly remained in the realm of my hobby or professional development project, but what happens if I give a presentation in front of a uh, conference of digital archivists and curators and actually encourage others to use it? Am I then holding myself accountable for a level of support, documentation, and maintenance that I can't sustain and I'm risking burnout? If part of the point was to make something useful for the community, does that also require community buy-in or decision-making to move forward? Next slide, please. I'm aware that many of these questions are eternal anxieties for open source projects, and I'm not about to solve them today. But as a part of preparing for this lightning talk, I was reading Uncurled, which is a free online guide to open source software development written by Daniel Stenberg, uh, the founding developer, developer for the curl command line utility. There's a lot of great advice in Uncurled, um, but I was particularly struck by this passage. The project is we, not I nor you. How you communicate in and about open source projects is important and will greatly affect how you and your work is perceived. When speaking of your project, even when you are the only single person who contributes to it for the moment, try to instead refer to it as our project. The project is a communal joint effort and we are a team that makes it. Sure, that team is sometimes or even often just the single you, but by being inclusive in your language, you make it clear and obvious that everyone is invited to be a part of the project. Next slide. I had many grand ideas for how to cap off this presentation when I first submitted it. Maybe I would officially announce version 1.0 of Kiwi and kick off a spirited campaign to deploy Kiwi by default in the BitCurator environment. Click, please. Maybe I would beg and plead for M-series Mac testers because I still have no idea if Kiwi even works on those. Maybe I would turn Kiwi into a peer mentorship effort and send around a poll for regular monthly meetings for those interested to talk through the code and software project management. Add a name for that last one and everything. Contributors would be called cassowaries. But reading Stenberg's advice made me pull back and reconsider, because all of those ideas started with I, and you can't pronounce Kiwi without we. Last slide, please. We would love for Kiwi to grow and be a more useful tool for archival workflows, maybe even a part of the BitCurator environment. But deciding how and when we work towards that goal can truly only be done in a healthy and supportive way if we make those decisions together. If you'd like to join us, please feel free to reach out directly via the Kiwi repository on GitLab or get in touch over email. Thank you all so much. And thanks again, Jess, for the slides. Thank you, Ethan. Um, that was a uh... Great presentation. Um, as we said, we will be taking questions at the end of the, um, after um, our next presentation. So please use the Q&A uh, at the bottom of your Zoom window uh, to pose some questions. Our next presentation is Integrating Archival Forensics with Digital Archiving Workflows. 
And um, this is a, a joint project from the University of Glasgow with Leo Constantilos, uh, Emma Jan, and Claire Peterson. Um, Leo and Emma will be presenting today. Thank you. Thanks, Kari, and hello, everyone. Can you hear me okay? I presume so. I can, I can see my yes. microphone icon going green. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. So that's us. I'm Leo, the, the, the one on the right, and um, I'm a senior assistant archivist, digital. So essentially, the, I'm, I'm the university digital archivist. Emma? Yep, and I'm Emma Yan. Um, I'm assistant archivist, and among other things, I work with our digital collections with Leo. And we are both within uh, a team called Archives and Special Collections. Specifically, we uh, address uh, digital preservation, digital curation, and archiving um, issues. And uh, altogether, we are in information services at the University of Glasgow. Next slide, please. So um, today, we would like to focus more on our work um, in, in integrating archival forensics with um, our digital archiving workflow. And along the way, we would like to talk a bit about how this process of integrating archival forensics um, created an impetus for us to, to um, update policies and procedures and look at other areas uh, that are pertinent uh, to digital archiving from a forensics point of view. And we will conclude with some of the opportunities and challenges um, that we identified in this journey. Next slide, please. Okay, so, and next slide, please. Sorry. <laughs> there we go. So very quickly, the reason why um, we were keen on putting together a digital archiving workflow and a, um, a forensics um, and archival forensics workflow is because we wanted to have a bird's eye view, first of all, of everything. Uh, and in doing so, identify any gaps in existing processes, any omissions, and create a common language because uh, even internally within our teams, um, we are not homogeneous. We have uh, people who come from an archiving um, background, a librarian, uh, librarianship background, uh, many of whom have had very little to do with digital and digital archiving. So that provides us a bit of a kind of foundation, a groundwork for, for all of this. Next slide, please. Emma, over to you. Okay, so... Um... We have created the digital archive and workflow. Um, that's the link there. It's also in the chat. Um, so it's available to view online on Copter's community-owned workflows. Um, so please take a look. Feel free to use it as inspiration for your own workflows if you'd like. Um, next slide, please. So if we take a quick look at the digital archive and workflow, um, I won't go into too much detail because it is online and you can take a closer look yourselves. Um, but as you can see on the screen here, we move through from pre-acquisition, um, which is where a group of archivists and librarians, we get together, discuss offers to our collections. Um, if we accept it, it moves on to acquisition, um, then accessioning, transfer, appraisal and ingest. Um, so you can see here that there are various endpoints in the workflow. That's them highlighted on the screen there with the red round about them. So um, one part that I want to point out in particular is the archival forensics workflow that comes um, into the accessioning section. So you can see here that after we've created our accession record and created the file manifest, before we move on to transfer, you can go through the archival forensics workflow or you can bypass it. So I'm going to pass back over to Leo, who will take you through the archival forensics workflow. Thanks, Emma. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So the archival forensics workflow is also available on Copter. Uh, if you access the link that Jess has very kindly shared uh, in the chat, you will also find this workflow um, uh, linked into it. So. Essentially, the archival, the archival forensics workflow uh, can work in two ways. Um, the first is the one that I think we all we are all very familiar with, the imaging bit. So uh, we will create uh, a forensic uh, image uh, of a storage medium. We will run certain tests to make sure that it's okay, that it has, you know, that it that the checksums are correct, 
uh, we will check it for viruses and it can end there for most of these things we we'll use our beautiful thread that you can see here on on the left uh, in in the forensics lab uh, and that can be so that can be the end of the process creating an image and then passing that image all back over into uh, to the um, uh, uh, digital archiving workflow. However, one uh, of the reasons why we were keen on having an archival forensics facility was to be able to uh, process predominantly large uh, data sets, very large um, storage media, <clears throat> and automate or semi-automate some of the archival processes through one uh, analysis tools. Again, I'm not going to go into too much detail uh, in this. By all means, you can ask more questions or you can contact us and uh, if you want more details. But what we predominantly use uh, are uh, tools are, that, that allow us to um, carve data, so retrieve deleted files, or um, uh, be able to access, hopefully, otherwise inaccessible uh, media and uh, decrypt encrypted files that have been encrypted with passwords. The, um, most of them are uh, all the Microsoft Office. These are the kind of most common offenders, but also other tools, you know, being able to identify names and so on. Ultimately, what we want to, to do is always have um, a forensically curated, uh, if you want, image um, that is then passed back into the digital archiving workflow. Uh, next slide, please. So um, I'll pass over to Emma now, um, and we will talk a little bit about how this process, creating the workflows and establishing archival forensics as part of our, our digital archiving efforts, have kind of forced us to look at policies and procedures. Emma. Yes, thank you. Okay, next slide, please. Excellent. Um, so we've been doing some uh, preparatory work on this kind of thing for a while now. Um, what you can see on the screen here is a poster that we presented at the International Digital Curation Centre conference in Dublin in February 2020. Um, it charts a timeline of the University of Glasgow's record keeping um, from 1451 when it was established um, and its transformation from paper to digital. Um, the highlighted area of the timeline shows the work that we did in creating our digital preservation policy. So discussions around about um, the policy started probably about 10 years before the Digital Preservation Working Group was established in 2015. But what we're working on now really started with the digital preservation policy and helped us to create our vision for 2020 and beyond, which is where we are at the moment. Next slide, please. So um, just having the workflows alone isn't enough. Um, we made the decision that we need to test the workflows. Um, so what we'd like to introduce you to now is what we're currently working on, um, an end-to-end -end digital pilot that's running from December 2022 to September 2023. So you can see the purpose of the pilot here on the screen. And by testing the digital archive and workflow, um, we're going to make sure that we've got all the related po procedures, policies, and guidance that we need in order to carry out the tasks that we want to complete. The archival forensics workflow is a big piece of this work, so we'll be referring to this as we go along. Next slide, please. Thank you. Okay, so one of the um, areas that we're focusing on in the pilot is collections development, um, which you might remember comes at the beginning of the digital archiving workflow. So we're actively reviewing the collection development policy, which is the basis for archives and special collections collecting. At the moment, it's not format specific and it doesn't mention digital materials at all. The policy focuses more on core collecting areas, and there is a section on condition and scale of collections, which again doesn't mention format. So what we want to do is review the policy to make sure that digital material is reflected in the text. We've also identified areas where we don't have any existing policies and procedures, so we'll be creating new ones. So for example, policies around accepted file formats for storage media, um, and this is all going to be based on our current and projected capabilities for format normalization and what kind of storage media we're able to access and preserve. Next slide, please. Another thing that the pilots prompted us to review are our existing donor agreements. So at the moment, our donor agreements are quite high level and they don't mention anything format specific. 
The understanding in a gift agreement is that legal ownership of the records is transferred to the University of Glasgow. However, on digital storage media, this can include deleted files. So Leo mentioned earlier that we are kind of looking into, you know, we're doing some data carving. But if a donor's already curated their data to delete records, then perhaps when they're given the records to us, they expect them to remain deleted. Or if a donor's reusing an old USB drive or external hard drive to transfer, then in forensic processing, we might pick up other unrelated files that they never expected or intended us to gain sight of. So as it says here, we're intending to review our donor agreements to include clauses for forensic processing of digital acquisitions, and we'll also establish guidance alongside this on recommended practices for transfer of material to us. So I will pass you back over to Leo. Thanks, Emma. Um, other areas that we identified uh, as requiring um, upgrades as part of the of the pilot and of looking more closely into archival forensics and dealing with uh, uh, physical storage media were around our uh, current conservation and quarantining practices. Uh, most of the of what's currently there uh, is geared towards physical records, so more around books or manuscripts, uh, you know, things that we commonly get into the archive uh, and special collections. Less so on physical storage media. I'm not going to go into some of the um, <laughs> horror stories that we've come across. All I'll say is mealworms inside a hard disk drive uh, <laughs> that came into the, the forensics lab. So as part of this process, we are also looking at um, extending and expanding a physical material conservation and quarantining for computer storage media. I, I am, we've included a list of resources there, the kinds of standards and um, guidelines that we are following. Um, so if you want more information, the, the links will be available. Oh, I think that Jess has just shared them. And if you want, again, more information, we can provide that. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, the other area is around selection and prior prioritization of um, storage media. We found ourselves with uh, a rather voluminous um, collection of computer storage media of various types, um, and we needed to develop a way to prioritize on a scale the, um, which of these should be processed first and within what time frame? Uh, we've submitted a paper on this uh, to this year's IPRES. So if it gets accepted, you will probably hear more about it. But for now, you know the the tool and the methodology take into account a number of different um, factors, and they prioritize processing of um, computer storage media on a scale of one to five with actions uh, recommended. Next slide, please. This is an area that is, uh, I guess, implicit to the digital archiving and um, archival forensics workflow. I mean, Fred is amazing, but the machine is a beast and uh, it consumes a lot of uh, power. Uh, and to be fair, most of the forensic processing that, that we do is quite um, energy hungry. So we have developed a couple of, and we're still developing methods um, to minimize the energy footprint from, from the process. Um, we have, we, we schedule, we use a tool to schedule uh, use of um, the forensic technology so that it's not ad hoc, uh, so that it's not reactive, but planned and organized. And we're quite conscious of the footprint of storage, especially our kind of cloud uh, cloud storage. Um, we don't ascribe to this kind of, let's save everything, um, just to minimize the, the energy footprint. Uh, next slide, please. Excuse me, you have one minute left. Thank you. So I will pass, I will, uh, can we please uh, quickly pass the next three slides? so that we stay within time. This just uh, tell you how we build uh, the forensics lab and how we did, we, we built a, um, an asset registry and uh, functional requirements. If you want more information about this or if we have time at the end, uh, we can go through them. So opportunities and challenges, next slide, please. 
So I guess like I'll speak up about the benefits um, uh, on, on kind of the, the archival business. Having a dedicated facility certainly focuses the attention of our colleagues and our managers and uh, university senior um, administration. It is the equivalent of a conservation studio. There is an understanding that we need to have something like that uh, for digital preservation and for archival forensics. Um, it has helped us review policies and procedures. And I guess by using uh, uh, the affordance of um, um, forensic uh, tools, we can create or start to create economies of scale. So process very large volumes of digital information uh, by automating or semi-automating some of these uh, processes that would otherwise have been prohibitive. Um, where are there opportunities? There are challenges. Uh, so Emma, next slide, please. Emma uh, will uh, talk to us uh, okay. about- And, uh, and you guys are at time, so. Okay, thank you. Okay, this is just, this is the last slide. So just very quickly, you know, what we are doing as well is um, challenging established archival processes. So as Leo has mentioned before, we've mentioned before, you know, we do our operate in a very kind of historically paper environment. It's um, making sure that, you know, we are trying to um, introduce a lot of change here, which can be scary and intimidating, but we need to make sure that we're kind of effectively advocating for this change and making everyone understand how we're doing it, why we're doing it. We don't want to terrify people with anything new. Leo. I think we'll skip this because everyone here more or less understands the, 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 the other complexities. Thank you very much. Uh, any questions or comments, please um, let us know. Next slide, please. And these are our contacts. Uh, do get in touch. If you want more information, we are happy to share uh, any of the resources that we have created. So if you want to see any uh, of the output that we presented, um, please let us know. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Leo and Emma, for that presentation. Um, we now have time for uh, questions uh, for, for um, all of our presenters, for Ethan or for uh, Jess and, or for, sorry, for Leo and Emma. Um, and um, Emily will lead the questions for us. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, uh, Kari. Uh, so while we get, uh, while we wait for uh, some questions to trickle in, I'll, I'll get us started uh, with a question uh, for Ethan. Um, Ethan, besides uh, time and labor, what and how much are the infrastructural costs uh, for creating Kiwi? Mm. Um, so, great question. Uh, obviously, developing tools requires a couple of different services. So, like I mentioned, I do do the code writing and sharing on GitLab, uh, which is a free service at the moment. <laughs> uh, of course, that's always kind of those free online cloud services are always constantly under threat, as we've seen with the Docker Hub recently threatening a free tier for open source projects. And even with, um, you know, alternatives like GitHub, you know, financial cost might not be the only factor, um, given, say, their GitHub's controversial Copilot AI program where they scraped open code repositories into a, you know, auto-generating code product um so there's you know costs involved with the you know cloud providers and choices um that i've made um either now or down the line there is also a literal um you know a big goal of mine was to distribute not just the source code or distribute kiwi as as a as a script um but in the form it was important to me to put it out there as just sort of like downloadable double click apps for mac OS, Windows, et cetera. Um, and in order to do that, you need a place to host those files so that people, you need a server so that people can go and download those. Um, so at the moment, the best option I have is a, like I said, a personal Nextcloud, which is an open source, you know, Google Workspace, Google Drive alternative platform um, that I just run for myself for personal backup and, and productivity reasons. Um, that's like a $25 monthly charge on DigitalOcean for the compute costs plus storage. Um, so, and, you know, the offering up those Mac OS Windows downloads for Kiwi is actually eating things that storage up um, faster um, than I anticipated. So that is going to be something I'm going to have to look into um, in, in the future is is where to host stuff. So um, always always some computing costs and service costs in, associated with development and 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 distribution. Awesome. Thanks. Uh, thanks for that. 
Um, so the next question is uh, for Leo and Emma. Uh, outside of writing it into the donor agreement, how are you addressing deleted materials and encrypted materials from an ethical standpoint that prioritizes the privacy of the donors? Emma, would you like to, to talk about this? Because I guess it's uh, more your area. Yes, sorry, I managed to somehow get rid of my screen while I was pressing on mute. Um, <laughs> yes, so um, really the donor agreement is going to be the kind of main thing there. This is for um, donations kind of going ahead in the future. So we would have those kind of discussions with the donors, trying to make them kind of understand as well, like, you know, that, you know, we have this facility to, with the archival forensics to be able to do this kind of data carving and you know there will be deleted materials and you know that kind of thing from an ethical standpoint that is kind of a big question for me and um, we would not make anything available to anyone that they wouldn't expect to be made available um, so it is something that is part of the pilot that we're running at the moment. These are the kind of considerations that we're having to make and we will have to make a decision about it. We haven't actually got to kind of finalising the donor agreement and that kind of thing yet. We might have, you know, different types of options. It also depends on who we're dealing with, you know, is the donor um, themselves, the people who created the records, are they actually giving them to us? Or is it somebody who, um, you know, is now deceased and we're getting records from them? Or is it, you know, a massive corporation that we're getting records from? Because we do have business records for kind of live companies. And um, so, yeah, sorry, it doesn't really answer your question, but there are lots of different considerations that we would make before we actually ever made anything available to anyone or, um, you know, retained deleted data without, you know, having a proper reason for it. Uh, thanks for that answer. Oh, oh, sorry. sorry. And no, in the ahead. meantime, very quickly, we also record all actions. We've created a tool for um, uh, documenting any digital archiving and forensics actions that we take on record. So if there have been deleted files retrieved, we don't prevent that uh, with a view to make a decision later. Sometimes we know that some something that the forensic software has retrieved should not be kept, like, for example, student records, old student records. We don't need to keep this, and it's not part of our mandate to, to keep that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, work in progress for sure. Thanks uh, for that answer. Uh, so we have another uh, question uh, for Leo and Emma. Um, so how did you determine what kind of appraisal criteria and or methodology to use in the processing phase? How did you determine metadata guidelines to use to create finding aids? So again, appraisal criteria are based on um, existing practices, like existing appraisal practices what we do what we are doing as part of this process is to extend them using the whatever um the forensic uh, software can afford us as in you know um uh, data carving um decryption and um, um, identifying known persons and so on uh, checking against known files uh, so i guess that's that's part of the uh, determination uh, anything else, Emma? Uh, no, not just now. And in terms of metadata guidelines, now that's a difficult one. The problem that we have with metadata is that we, what we're trying to do is use um, the forensic software. We're using a combination of BitCurator and FTK. Uh, and we are trying to use the, the um, uh, index, the, the indexes that this uh, kinds of software create in order to then export a list of metadata uh, and and other terms it hasn't been it's it's it has been a little bit hit and miss at this point the idea and it's definitely the the vision is to build on this through the pilot by trialing and and trying different things working also with the community with peers elsewhere see what others have done um, and then use that kind of whatever we, we learn, whatever metadata we can automatically extract into finding it. 
The one area that works a little bit better is um, FTK's AI component, uh, which uh, I guess automatically creates metadata for images. This is a little bit a la um, um, Office. You, have you seen how in, in Microsoft Word, for instance, it can create, it can automatically create descriptions for images. That's what it does. Is it accurate? Sort of, depending on how kind of broad you want to be, but at this point and with the volume of data that we are dealing with something is definitely better than nothing so that's that's where we're at thank you so time. much <laughs> um so next question uh for uh ethan is uh and i think this will be our last question did you use the uh it takes a village uh open source project toolkit and if so was it of any use to you i did not um and thank you for reminding me that that exists because i'm going to go read it as soon as i can <laughs> after this presentation uh awesome uh so we then we have one last quick question uh for uh leo and emma um someone a uh, question from the chat was uh uh to do you, uh are all of your storage media forensically imaged or do you ever do file transfer uh particularly thinking of uh usbs so we only do file transfers for network data. So anything that we have a mandate to um, digitally archive that is already stored on university servers, that we do, uh, that, that we transfer as a file transfer. Anything that is on storage media, we image first. And the reason why we do that is because, frankly, we don't know when we will get the chance to process the stuff. Um, so we'd rather have a safely stored forensic image in the first place and then not and, and not rely on the storage media uh, as much. Um, again, the prioritization tool is meant to help here for us to first do those that are most at risk of, of um, uh, becoming inaccessible. Um, and USBs are quite high up on that list. Also, by imaging USBs at times, we've been managed to kind of carve to, to uh, retrieve deleted files that uh, in some cases could be necessary. So that's the that's generally the, the, the approach that we're taking. Thank you for that. Uh, and I'll hand it over to uh, Kari to wrap things up. Okay. Well, thank you um, to all the participants uh, for the session. We had about, we had over um, 100 people uh, joining session one, so that's very exciting. Um, and thank you to our presenters, Ethan and Leo and um, Emma as well. Uh, next is a 15-minute break uh, for the forum, and uh, the session, session two will begin um, after that. So uh, the hashtags are available if you didn't see the welcoming um, uh, presentation that's on the website. Um, and thank you so much for attending session one of the Bit Curator Forum this year. <laughs>